Refik hocam duyuyoruz sizi. Şuna bak. Computer audio. Evet. Tamam. Duyuyormuş aslında. Do you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Do you hear me? Ben de duymuyorum onları. Onlar mutlu Hmm? I'm ready to go anytime you are. The thing is, he can't hear us. They're trying to fix the problem. I see. Oh. Okay. Susan, I'm going to say. Bir dakika, o zaman. Şebnem seni çok mutluyuz burada. Öyle mi? Biz sizi çok iyi duyuyoruz. Evet, siz konuşun sonra. Uh, well, uh, I presume uh, Burak has introduced uh, Professor Galbraith, uh, and I would like to say uh, good morning to you, Professor Galbraith. Uh, uh, as the, uh, it's a privilege to host you, and as the title uh, of the uh, lecture goes, uh, it is. COVID-19 and America so far. And I presume uh, we will go a bit uh, further than uh, the current situation. Uh, hopefully we will have time. I presume that uh, Professor Galbraith would probably uh, start with a snapshot uh, of the current emergency situation, the medical situation, uh, as well as the economic uh, situation, uh, where we stand. And then uh, the policy response to it, or the lack of it, uh, I presume, uh, and gradually uh, what should be done uh, and what will the new normal be? Uh, since Professor Galbraith uh, has been writing extensively on the new normal uh, after the financial crisis, and uh, the situation preceding the financial crisis. Uh, and uh, he is very well, uh, I would say, rehearsed uh, experience in that. And uh, probably, uh, probably this is a, an even uh, deeper, uh, deeper crisis, a deeper uh, breakdown of the, uh, of the system. Uh, uh, in uh, very negative ways, in a way, but as well from every evil uh, comes out, every disruption comes out, uh, some presumably good things as well. Uh, please go ahead, uh, Professor. Uh, I'll try to uh, listen to your lecture uh, through other machines and so on. Uh, my uh, wife, who was my ex-assistant, uh, has lost her, uh, her uh, I guess, uh, uh, technology, although she's working in Google. Uh, probably this is Zoom is protesting, uh, protesting Google. Which is your, which is your machine? Which is your what? Google Meet. Meet. Google Meet. Next she's time, well versed Google in Meet. that. Please go ahead. Thank you very much indeed, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be able to talk with you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I will be somewhat watching the clock as oh, I have yeah. to be at another meeting shortly after noon today, but uh, uh, I'll do what I can here. Uh, I would like to uh, as, do exactly as you suggested in, in the introduction, which is to begin with a, a, a snapshot of the situation in the United States 
uh, and then to discuss the, uh, the the current policies and the and the and the uh, the policy implications uh, going forward. Um, and a useful way to begin with that is, like, I think one of the most useful uh, summary bits of information about the whole global situation with this pandemic was something I, I encountered about a month ago, and which has not unfortunately been updated, but it's very interesting. The series of charts that to give the experience of a, a number of major countries uh, prepared by a professor of geography at Oxford named Danny Dorling. Uh, and posted to, uh, to to a site on which he was writing. Uh, and it uh, gives for us uh, a sense of the commonality and the experience of a range of countries uh, by charting on one axis the, the increase or in decrease in deaths per day, and on the other, the average number of deaths. Uh, and one can see that in all the cases up to, this is up to the early part of April, uh, you one hand, after a certain point uh, of uh, intervention in the, um, uh, in, in, the, in the course of the pandemic, uh, a, the beginnings of a turnaround. And countries had worse or better experiences depending upon how quickly uh, they arrested the exponential growth curve of infections. Um, those that did so uh, very uh, early, uh, and this is the case of, uh, of China in particular, um, and were relatively successful in containing uh, the spread of the virus, uh, were able to manage a situation in which, uh, in the Chinese case, ultimately, uh, the deaths per, uh, mm -hmm. per day were driven back down to zero. Uh, and one there, another case which was relatively successful, at least as of early April, was the German case, uh, where by the uh, 3rd of April, there was a significant uh, already decrease in, uh, decrease in the number of deaths per day. Um, the countries that were less successful uh, included, uh, of course, uh, Italy, Spain, France, and uh, the United States. Um, and the only thing I've added to the graph in this particular case is the position of the U.S. today, uh, which is now roughly is here, uh, where there, at least in the last several days, there's mm -hmm. been uh, very little increase or decrease in the deaths per day. It's stable in the range of 13 or 1400 per day. Uh, and so that's the point on the graph uh, that where we are at now. Um, however, this would be a very misleading picture of what has happened uh, in the period between the 2nd of April and the, um, uh, and, the, and, and the present time, because what uh, if I and I didn't have time to, to prepare a, a graphic to show this, but just checking the numbers. In fact, over this period, we've gone through a, a very major escalation in the number of deaths per day, and the increase was up into the roughly a thousand per day uh, at the worst period, and the total number of deaths per day had gone up to three thousand. So, in fact, we've done an enormous loop uh, through this uh, space to come to the point where it looks as though. Uh, we were where uh, this very simple model might have projected we would be uh, sometime earlier. And the fact is uh, that the United States experience in this has been uh, and continues to be in the world uh, one of the worst for which there are uh, accurate, more or less accurate records, uh, at least as far as hospitalizations and deaths are concerned. Um, and that reflects uh, a couple of things. Uh, one, one of which is the extreme tardiness with which uh, the country began to react to the pandemic. Uh, we were alerted uh, by the Chinese uh, Centers for Disease Control on the 31st of December. No action was taken for months. And in fact, uh, lockdowns and shutdowns in the United States did not begin until roughly the 23rd of March. So it's a very long period uh, during which uh, we could have been preparing and we did not prepare adequately. Uh, there was a fiasco with respect to testing. Uh, and when action did come, the coordination was lacking at the federal level. Uh, and uh, one can, uh, I think, uh, search for words that are sufficiently harsh uh, to describe uh, what, um, what had happened, what happened in terms of national leadership in this country by comparison with practically anywhere else uh, in the world. It simply hasn't been uh, existent in a serious way. Uh, and we have had um, a uh, interference of incompetence uh, uh, and I should say of economists who are also incompetent uh, 
uh, to handle this, who's, who's, whose views have been uh, taken seriously in this matter, uh, and uh, uh, political considerations as we're facing a presidential election in November. And all of these things have combined to um, make the federal government an almost completely ineffective force in dealing with this. Um, I uh, would set out uh, essentially three phases uh, in the uh, course of, a, of, of these events um, and uh, just describe them very briefly for you. Um, the first phase as the uh, extent of the calamity became finally clear uh, might be called the crisis phase. Um, and this was a phase in which uh, we were facing in this country uh, a, uh, basically, first of all, an ineffective testing regime because the country failed to use the uh, tests that were available from the World Health Organization, insisted upon developing its own, and then proceeded uh, to uh, uh, uh, screw up the production of the first round of tests. So it was a very delayed, uh, ineffective process, which meant that testing criteria were restricted, uh, and so one could not find uh, cases that were not associated with travel back from overseas, especially from China and later from Europe. Uh, because nobody who didn't have that record was uh, was being tested for the uh, for the disease, so we simply do not know, and did not know until very late the extent to which community spread was occurring in this country. We had an acute shortage of personal protective equipment, uh, and as a result of the fact that uh, uh, supply chains uh, for that sort of thing, very simple things like face masks, uh, but also more complex things. I'm not, I'm, ventilators are not PPE, but um, face mask gowns, this kind of thing, uh, had been globalized. Uh, and of course, uh, as the pandemic first arrived in the countries which were major producers of this equipment, uh, supplies, uh, the supply chains were interrupted. Uh, and in fact, there was a, a negative flow as the stocks that were in this country were, uh, in, in fact, and not improperly uh, transferred back to uh, China and other places which had uh, more immediate needs for them in January. Um, but in any event, that meant that, that in many cases, healthcare workers were not provided with PPE. Certainly, ordinary hospital workers were not provided. And workers in the supply chain who were exposed to customers, for example, were not provided. Workers in the supply chain for meats and other places where you have people packed into small spaces were not provided with protective equipment. And we're suffering the consequences of that now. Uh, also, there were shortages of in, uh, intensive care units. Uh, there were uh, a fear of shortage of, of ventilators, which didn't, in the end didn't appear to be as serious as it seemed to be at the beginning. But those issues uh, were part of the acute phase of this uh, of this uh, pand of this epidemic. Uh, one can then go to the to what one might call a second phase, a containment phase. Uh, in which um, measures were being implemented on, with mostly at the level of state governors with respect to the whole uh, population and basically divides the population into two substantial groups. Uh, a large group, uh, which was simply uh, told to shelter in place, to, uh, to quarantine themselves, to stay home, uh, to take only the minimal steps necessary to maintain themselves during this period while the break the, in order to break the transmission. So as by and large, the economic activity in the larger part of the country simply ceased. Uh, and the smaller group, which was necessary to maintain essential public services, uh, food supplies, supplies of basic medicines and other essential activities. And that definition of what that was was quite elastic actually, but uh, uh, but that's a smaller group that was in what was a uh, necessary to maintain employment and to run risks that others were not necessarily having to run. Um, so and that operation uh, we call the, we can be called the containment phase. It's a phase which required much more attention uh, to the basic maintenance of essential supplies and to the enforcement of the lockdowns uh, than was actually given uh, compared to countries which ran this process efficiently compared uh, and particular to the Republic of Korea, the People's Republic of China. Uh, this was uh, a, uh, um, a not well run operation in the United States, in part because, as I say, it was run differentially across different states. It was nevertheless not ineffective. Uh, it did um, apparently slow the process and the exponential growth of the infection of the uh, infections and hospitalizations uh, and managed just barely in most cases to keep in some cases, anyway, to keep 
the course of hospitalizations below the capacity of the healthcare system. A very close run thing. Uh, and certainly in parts of New York, it was it, it, those capacities were exceeded at least for a time. Um, in much of the country, they weren't. They were never, they never, we never so far have come close to them in, in my region of Texas, where the capacity is about 3,000 beds in a five county area, and only 80 of them actually are being used. And that's about as high as it's gotten. Uh, so one has to say that, there, that the course uh, was altered by these measures, uh, but that they were efficiently run. No, they were not. Uh, and we're going to run into the difficulties now. Uh, after a necessary now six week period uh, from the middle of March to, uh, to the present, uh, the pressures are now on to end the containment phase. Um, and this is, leads to a, a fundamental choice, uh, essentially, in the policies uh, that we're taking. And we are, uh, uh, the one, one choice is to, is to try and maintain the containment phase as China, and apparently Germany and some other places have done, New Zealand, uh, until the uh, course of the epidemic is suppressed. And the more effectively do, you do that, of course, the more uh, thoroughly you can relax uh, the requirements afterwards. The other course, which is the one that we are on, uh, is um, assuming uh, that there's no uh, miracle associated with the warmer weather or something like that, and there's no evidence that such a miracle will occur, uh, is one in which the uh, increased um, economic activity uh, is going to lead to a rolling series in, of infections, increases in infections, and then renewed lockdowns. And this is what, in fact, is being projected uh, by modeling groups that I'm familiar with, at least one that I'm familiar with, uh, in which the, so the, the path that is being chosen is one in which uh, hos uh, infections, hospitalizations, and deaths will be allowed to rise uh, and then brought, try to control them again as time goes on uh, over a period of a year or more uh, in order to keep them just below the capacity of the, of the healthcare system uh, to handle them. Uh, and that is a, a process which is supposed to come to an end if uh, when there is a therapy or a vaccine, the problem there, of course, is that there is no known uh, therapy or vaccine. And so far, there has not been any successful vaccine against a coronavirus. So whether one can be developed for this particular one is a very uncertain situation at the present time. Uh, but the strategy of not going for suppression, uh, uh, which is the strategy we're undertaken, uh, is uh, uh, we are undertaking is a strategy which presumes that it someday uh, there will be such a uh, either a therapy or a um, or, or or a vaccine, uh, and uh, there's a, that's a riverboat gamble if there ever was one. Uh, a consequence of having some countries adopt a strategy of essentially what they call it mitigation, but I would call it rolling infections, uh, is that those countries will be a persistent threat uh, to the countries that don't adopt that strategy, the countries that have suppressed the virus, who will essentially, in order to maintain their success have to maintain very rigorous controls over any travel, uh, any transmission that might be coming back uh, from, uh, uh, from the countries which are not successful in, in, in suppressing the epidemic. Uh, and that, of course, is what's underway. And, and you talk about China and other places, and, you, and simply uh, maintaining very, very tight controls over arrivals uh, from countries which are still in the course of the pandemic. Um, well, that's a problem we're going to have to think about. Uh, a number of issues come up in discussing just how the containment phase was managed in the United States. Uh, and that they, uh, there was a, a great emphasis on attempting to support people financially, uh, as well as, I might add, um, uh, vast amounts of money to support stockholders and bondholders of major corporations to prevent an early wave of bankruptcies, particularly in sectors which are going to be impacted immediately, like airlines and cruise ships and hotels and so forth. But on the, with respect to the broader population, there were a number of things that are worth mentioning. A payroll protection program, which involved basically loans to small businesses, tax rebates, uh, which were mailed out through the IRS to uh, Internal Revenue Service to households, unemployment insurance relatively uh, relatively generous by past standards with an extra $600 per week supplement. All of these things turned out to be quite problematic in the way they were implemented. Payroll protection has complicated uh, provisions for uh, forgiveness of those loans, uh, and many businesses that, um, that signed up for them are reluctant now to uh, actually use the money. 
uh, because they may find themselves in a position where they have to repay the loan when, of course, they have no revenue with which to do so. The tax rebates were based upon out-of-date tax forms, 2018. Uh, many people's position has changed. And of course, they required you to have direct deposit. So millions of people who did not have direct deposit uh, from the IRS uh, waiting for paper checks to arrive, which is a slow and cumbersome process. Unemployment insurance uh, was so heavily subscribed to, about 30 million Americans so far have signed up for it, that the state apparatus for uh, handling it crashed. Uh, so many people were unable to sign up. Uh, and the opening up process, which is occurring in Georgia and Texas, uh, has the effect of workers being called back. And if they don't wish to go because they don't feel the situation is safe, they're no longer in, um, involuntarily unemployed and so their benefits can be cut off. So this turns out to have been uh, something of a, um, a hollow promise in many people, some of whom have not received the benefits in the first place, now find that they're being called back to jobs uh, which uh, are, are being offered under conditions that are, uh, are not safe. Uh, if they don't choose to go, uh, then they don't get the benefits. Uh, so there they are. There we are on that. Uh, there is a, uh, a, um, a provisional deferral of evictions, foreclosures, utility stoppages, um, but uh, no forgiveness of those loans. So those of those de debts, so that people who are in that position are building up liabilities, which they will have to discharge or later on or face um, uh, eviction and foreclosure. Um, and the problem there is that there's no replacement of their incomes so that uh, these liabilities are simply added on top of what already exists. Uh, and then there are issues with telecommunications, public services and so forth that uh, had to be maintained. Um, so I'll come on to that. Um, there were also issues on the supply chain uh, in the containment phase and I, I, I mentioned them very briefly. Uh, major issues with respect to worker safety uh, we're seeing uh, a, a significant disruption, not, a, not, not I think, uh, on the crisis level, but in, in terms of the supply, but a significant disruption, emblematic disruption of, the, of, of, of certain kinds of foods, particularly meats, because those are, those are prepared under particularly dangerous conditions. Uh, the workers in uh, the food supply chain still largely lack health care coverage. Uh, they don't have uh, protections that are adequate. Uh, to maintain them. So there's a dangerous situation there, the problem of contamination of facilities, uh, problem of inadequate pay and retention. There's been a certain amount of, of panic buying and destocking, but the real problem in food supply has been at the bottom of the chain, which is to say uh, uh, uh, food pantries and uh, food, um, uh, food banks, uh, which are reliant on volunteer labor and on donations having severe trouble. Uh, and there have been problems, some problems anyway, with disruption of the flow of migrant labor, which has also been true in parts of Europe. Although I think in the United States, those problems have been relatively mild. Uh, so those are issues which um, have come up in the, uh, uh, in the containment phase, but we're moving along now uh, to a larger set of problems. Um, they, uh, they include uh, the fact that we are, do not have adequate testing capacity yet. Uh, and so far, the, the, the growth rate of that capacity does not look like it's going to be sufficient to deal with effectively with a, with a testing regime. That supplies of, of personal protective equipment are better, but they're still not adequate. We do, do not have a contact tracing regime uh, set up in this country. I don't believe almost anywhere. Some pilots in Massachusetts and elsewhere. Uh, we are running this on the basis of uh, opening up on the basis of economic forecasts, uh, which are highly optimistic for a major recovery the second part of the year, uh, which is obviously what is intended by the people in uh, the White House as they uh, look forward to the November election. Without that recovery, their chances are obviously much less than they would otherwise be. And there's substantial pressure from businesses, which are um, obviously losing revenue and uh, facing the prospect of bankruptcy. Um, there's also a good deal of pressure on and both on and from state governments, uh, which are facing, which have balanced budget requirements and are facing uh, severe uh, revenue shortfalls as sales taxes, income taxes, every kind of tax revenue, except possibly property taxes, uh, is falling off extremely sharply. Um, in Texas, uh, which is roughly the same size as Spain in terms of its economy, the fall off in industrial activity in the month of April was on the order of about 80%. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, that, that's uh, that, that's much deeper uh, than the um, fall off in uh, you know, substantially deeper than the fall off at the peak of this lump in 2000, early 2009. Um, and as I mentioned, um, the effect on workers of the opening up strategy is to disrupt the flow of support payments to them. So they're faced with a, a very um, grim choice between uh, returning to work under dangerous conditions uh, or uh, giving up their benefits. And the work is such uh, that uh, restrictions on the capacity uh, available to restaurants and things like that and uh, shopping malls and so forth, 25% of capacity movie theaters uh, is such that they cannot, most for the most part, make a profit anyway. So there are many small businesses, well, chains have, have by and large, my information is decided to open. Many small businesses are simply saying it's not worth it. There's no point. They're going to face bankruptcy anyway. And we're going to look at a major disappearance of, a, of sole proprietorships uh, in this country as time goes forward. Uh, what's the aftermath, if there is an aftermath? Uh, this is, I think we're a very long way from the aftermath. So when I gave a talk on this um, three weeks ago, I thought, well, it's relatively straightforward and get through the containment phase and then you have to deal with the aftermath. The aftermath is not a pleasant uh, prospect, but at least it's after. I'm no, no longer at all confident that, there will, that we will be at the aftermath for uh, many, many months, uh, if that. Uh, but if we could get there, uh, then a, a number of things uh, have to be considered. First of all, uh, the United States obviously does not have an effective public health regime. Uh, and great many things that were there in the 50s and 60s, um, at a time when we were, for example, successfully combating poliomyelitis and other uh, infectious diseases, tuberculosis, were not there anymore. They simply have gone. Uh, and we do not have the, um, uh, the public health facilities nor the personnel uh, to handle this properly and certainly not at the federal level. Uh, so uh, to think about this as an ongoing problem, and we're obviously allowing the virus to become deeply embedded, as long as it doesn't go away by itself, uh, it's uh, going to be a public health hazard going forward indefinitely. Uh, and we're going to need many, many hundreds of thousands, millions of people to do monitoring, to do contact tracing, uh, to do testing. Uh, and we're going to need a, a reserve public health capacity for other, for further um, uh, attacks of this kind, viruses of this kind. And we're going to need uh, to have some mechanism to allow us to have cultural sporting events, restaurants, bars, cafes, a whole spectrum of ordinary social life under conditions under which uh, one, is, uh, one is guarding uh, from inf infection uh, in this area. So again, the monitoring of customers as well as the figuring out a way to, which I'm, I think has to be considered to be a, a changing these sectors into a cooperative model, schools as well, uh, in order to um, make them functional at a much lower rates of, of, of capacity utilization and essentially on a not-for-profit basis, on a subsidized basis. Otherwise, they won't be there at all. Uh, there are obviously going to be changes uh, due to technology and the uh, uh, taking up of, of new technologies. I think many businesses chose the route of leaving their workers unemployed and taking them, putting them on unemployment insurance rather than keeping them on payroll because they anticipated changing their technologies afterwards. Uh, the technology like the one we're using um, is actually quite a good technology. It permits me to talk to you without having to get on an airplane and spend two or three days um, passing through airports and so forth. Um, so that's quite quite all right. And I've been doing my students uh, with my students that way. I see a lot more uh, of, of, of uh, essentially this kind of conferencing, this kind of work from home situation, uh, and which means that uh, among other things, there would be a lot less commuting, uh, which means a lot less utilization of automobiles, uh, a lot less travel. It's obvious that nobody is going to buy a commercial airline or no airline is for a long time as they have more on the ground than they do in the air at the present time. And the only one reason they're flying is that it's too expensive to park them. Uh, and they, uh, they, they are, uh, they'd rather keep them up in the air than, than um, well, they have no real alternative but to keep them up in the air actually. So no parking places left. Uh, so they have, um, uh, that issue, uh, obviously nobody's going to buy a new airplane in that, so those circumstances. Many people will no longer need to have this many cars. And so that industry is going to have to make a serious shrink. The oil industry in this country has been um, deeply compromised by the collapse of oil prices. It's an expensive fracking industry in the Permian Basin, for example, the Bakken. Uh, 
uh, and the result of the of the collapse of oil prices is going to be the shutdown of many of those wells, which will not be restored because once they're shut, they sand and clog up and they become very expensive to reopen. So we're going to look at a major reconfiguration of this country for the first time in 100 years away from petroleum as, as its principal fuel. Um, as, unless we go back to importing it on a massive scale, which we will for a while, but I don't think that's a sustainable proposition either. Uh, there are going to be a lot of changes due to the fact that um, uh, that people's wealth is going to be adjusted downward. Uh, to say we will not have the travel and leisure uh, industries uh, that we've had that have been a major piece of um, American so-called growth in the last um, you know, decade or so. Um, and it's, I think it's quite likely that people will simply not, the experience of, of adjusting to the pandemic will have an effect on values and, and consumer habits and a great many things that were considered that were considered desirable no longer considered essential and people will be uh, adjusting downward the entire stream of purchases of consumer durables of all kinds uh, and so you're looking from the standpoint of production of those things a major major uh, adjustment essentially a long-term uh, depression stagnation uh, in those business lines uh, so uh, and that means a lot of unemployment, which will have to be taken up. Uh, if it's going to be taken up at all, will have to be taken up on a parapublic basis. It's going to have to be taken up uh, in community service. It's going to have to be taken up in public health. It's going to have to be taken up in other other activities, which we have in, in, in, in energy transformation and in, in, in infrastructure investment and other things that we haven't uh, begun to plan for. And those things are uh, substantially public in character and they're, they're so far uh, very little thinking about how, how to make them happen in a serious way. Uh, and then the finally, a, a major issue uh, that uh, will affect the aftermath um, and conditions a lot of what I've just said is that the debts that were built up before uh, when the 10 year expansion following the crisis, a great deal of it was fueled by consumer debt, by student debt, by, um, by car and automobile debt, and uh, also by mortgages. Uh, the mortgages were not as big a piece as they were in the 2000s. But all of those debts are compounded now by uh, deferred rent, deferred mortgages, uh, utility bills, uh, other obligations that people have uh, rightly been uh, deferring because they don't have the income to meet them. And so, and, and that's just true at the international level as well. So I think you're looking at a uh, financial adjustment, a crisis, if you like, which is uh, uh, on very much on the, on the scale or larger, maybe substantially larger than the one we faced 13 years ago. Uh, that's uh, something, uh, and the difference is that um, in the great financial crisis, you could make, and they, people did make the political case that, um, that the debts um, and people incurred in, in, for example, signing on to mortgages that they should never have taken that those debts were, you know, the, the somehow the fault of the of the of the uh, of, of the consumer. It was not a very good argument then, but it's a completely in, um, useless argument now. Everybody understands that the reason people are out of their have, running up their debts is they don't have incomes, and the reason they don't have incomes is a is a pandemic uh, and the public health measures, which are not their own fault or responsibility. So there will be a major social conflict if those debts are enforced. Uh, it seems to me that's uh, uh, baked into the situation that we're going into. Let me see what else I have here. Uh, oh yeah, just by way of quick conclusions, uh, it's not a short-term issue. Uh, we're not gonna be out of this by the fall. Uh, the, uh, uh, economists in the United States government who think that we will be are um, essentially speaking to, a, uh, speaking to an audience of one, a president who wants to be told what he wants to hear. Nobody else should take this seriously because it's simply a ludicrous proposition being advanced by ludicrous people. Um, but further and more seriously, the acute phase of this uh, crisis is being prolonged by policy actions that were taken.
we do have it at the mix at the Görüntü takıldı galiba. Görüntü takıldı. Sorry, Professor can we can? Professor okay. Galbraith. Professor Galbraith. Düştü hatta. All right, I'm back uh, and I'll wrap up very quickly here. Um, just uh, apologize for that. Um, they, um, there's my... All right, can... Can you see that? I can't see it myself here. I'm going to stop the sharing and just wrap up very quickly uh, because I and so it's not to detain you further. Uh, the basic further conclusion is that this is not viable. It's not viable for the predators and not viable for the prey either. Uh, and so uh, at some point of that which uh, cannot be made to happen will not happen. Uh, and we will be faced with some very fundamental choices in this country about how to organize economic life going forward. Enough. I have. 20 minutes now that I can um, give you or maybe a little bit longer for any comments or questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a very encompassing, very encompassing uh, lecture. I have two uh, minor questions concerning the Response. I've got too much feedback to, to, to hear you, I'm afraid. Uh, can you make any comments on the uh, response of the, uh, the fiscal response of the Treasury uh, and the uh, Fed uh, monetary response? Okay, if that was a question, I'm afraid I didn't hear it. I'd, uh, Uh, the response of the Treasury, the fiscal response, uh, and the response of the uh, Federal Reserve, the monetary response. Can you make any comments on that, please? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, the Treasury's response is just the response of the U.S. Congress, uh, and it involved $100 billion, $2 trillion. insurance payroll protection, other things of that nature. Uh, I thought that the whole process was inefficient uh, and uh, 
All right, we're back again. Okay. So uh, I thought that the, that the fiscal package, while uh, substantial, was um, largely uh, as I say, inefficient and largely based upon uh, uh, the model legislative the crisis of the 2007, uh, which was uh, 2009, which was a, uh, a financial bailout for the bank. Since then, there was uh, some resilience in the American economy, but it's, it's not appropriate to the to the problem we're facing here, which had a substantial supply component, medical services, public health services, uh, and uh, the business of organizing the economy around a, a maintenance and so that you could keep people successfully in their homes uh, over the time that uh, and maintain services over the time required to manage the pandemic. That's where we failed. We did not do this as a wartime mobilization. And as a result, the containment phase was not sustainable. Uh, which is why governors and so forth are letting up. Now they're accepting that we're gonna have a lot more infections and deaths, unless somehow we get very lucky. In terms of the Federal Reserve's response, yeah, I should have said a, a bit more about that. Uh, they have in fact uh, been useful. Uh, they in particular have been discounting various kinds of paper, uh, and all kinds of corporate paper, but also uh, paper from states and municipalities uh, that uh, they were not discounting before. Uh, and so they've made it at least possible uh, for states uh, and localities, and big localities anyway, there's a certain size limit, they don't go to small ones, uh, to uh, fund themselves uh, as necessary. The problem there is that states are unwilling, uh, are unable to, to, to, to, to borrow to cover operating costs. They have balanced budget requirements, so they can't do that. And they're unwilling to take out capital-based loans under the circumstances because they're not sure they can service them over the long runs. So what they probably should be, states should probably be more uh, forthcoming in taking up assistance from the Fed than they have been, uh, but they have their own reasons why not. Now, so what really needs to happen is for the federal government to federalize a large share of state revenues. The problem there is that the Republican leadership in the Senate in particular uh, doesn't want to do that because they want to force states to renegotiate, basically to break their teachers' unions and renegotiate or break their pension funds. Uh, and uh, that, that is uh, uh, a political objective that is getting in the way of doing uh, what is essential, which is maintaining public services. Uh, so we're going to see a real problem with decentralized public services. So essentially, everything is, is based upon growth. And if you have growth, the system works. But once you stop, uh, everything implodes at a very rapid rate, and that's what's happening now. Thank you very much. Is there any burning question out there? I'm anxious for burning questions or even, you know, smoldering ones. Even slightly smoky ones would do. In that case, I will, I will ask another question. Go ahead. Uh, the implication of this, of course, will be a new normal, will be incredible. But at the same time, the implication on income distribution that you have dealt with uh, concerning the previous crisis will also be devastating, I believe. What would you comment on that? I, I got the phrase, the new normal, but I, I lost a little bit of the rest of the question. Income distribution impact. The which impact? Income distribution. Oh, the income distribution impact. Yeah, well, uh, the uh, initial impact is very clear. There were some people, we don't know exactly who, who made, it was reported around $230 billion by selling the market short this time. Uh, and uh, that was not as, uh, let's say, admirable an operation as, uh, as one might have, as Michael Lewis wrote about in the big short after the last one. Uh, 
Um, they, uh, this was a situation in which uh, people were in a position that because they had information other people didn't have. Um, and uh, some of that was uh, came from intelligence briefings. So we know that some members of the United States Senate sold their stock positions after getting briefed by the intelligence agencies in January. Uh, that's obviously, and those capital transactions are the main thing that affect the, the distribution of wealth in the short run. Uh, what we are going to see uh, is that those who have liquid wealth are going to be in a very strong position to buy up distressed assets. And they're already going to do that. Hedge funds are going to be buying up housing. Uh, and there's going to be pressure from them to enforce foreclosures so that they can, in fact, get people Get, get real estate um, and become essentially the same. And on the, the, the predatory landlords that many of them became after the last crisis, that process will be deepened. Uh, so you'll have a transfer from homeowners to, uh, from homeowning to renting and from, uh, from, uh, from distributed land ownership, home ownership to uh, essentially co concentrated home ownership. I don't think that is going to go down very well this time. Uh, I, I think last time, as I say, you could uh, the forces that were arrayed against it were somewhat disorganized, and you could you could essentially blame the victim. You can't blame the victim on this one. Uh, that doesn't mean that they won't succeed uh, in doing this, but um, that's uh, going to uh, generate. Uh, if there's any capacity for social uh, pushback in this country, that will generate it. I think. Um, they, um, so the income distribution consequences are likely very bad until such time uh, as we have a major upheaval in the politics of the country. Uh, and then you have the New Deal. And then you have a total transformation of the system because the only way to make it work is to transform it. Uh, and uh, at that point, you can, you can begin to think in terms of a, a very quick uh, reversal of all of this, but you really then have to put the financial demons back in their box. Uh, as the New Deal succeeded for about a 40 year period in doing. Um, but short of that, uh, the, uh, the system will not recover. What we've, what we've had in um, recent years is remarkable ability to make the system recover because the New Deal institutions continued to function. Uh, but the stresses on them now are so strong that I don't think they will unless they're rebuilt uh, and restored by, by very active policy. And that means a, a, a political change, obviously. Um, I, I don't know what will happen in the next election, but uh, and it's the choices at this point are, are, are not, let's say, forward looking, but we're only at the start of May and the election is until November. Uh, we don't know what, what will even happen in the Democratic Party. I don't think that's entirely settled at this point yet, uh, despite appearances. Everybody else thinks it is, but I say, it, wait, wait till they get to the convention and see what happens there. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions from other participants, please? We still have it's a, a very couple quiet of group. I'm happy to take a question from somebody. Surely there's well, an abstract question. One final. I'm right. using uh, my uh, <coughs> my position as a host, but. Uh, what about debt, government debt and fiscal deficits? Yeah, um, well, the, the, the government has shown by its actions that it can uh, do what it wants uh, as any government which controls its own currency and issues debt in its own, uh, its own currency unit can do. Uh, and the, uh, the, the interest rates on that debt are, are, are, uh, have fallen. They haven't increased and the, the treasury bill remains a safe haven uh, as the, and the problem of the dollar has not been that it's gone too low, but that it has gone up, uh, which is extraordinary considering that the underlying economy is in a state of, of, of, of, of, of, of collapse. Um, but uh, is a, I always quote the Iron Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, which, uh, who was reported at the end of his life to remark that the almighty providence looks out for drunks, fools in the United States of America. Uh, the, uh, uh, the situation, however, uh, in real terms is not so good. Uh, I mean, as to say, uh, we're going to face, uh, right now, of course, there's a glut of oil. 
uh, but that glut is going to deplete American production capability and bring an end to the fracking boom. Uh, and at that point, uh, then the United States becomes a residual consumer uh, on the world market. Uh, and it will depend upon what happens to the supply outside the United States uh, that uh, uh, uh, will happen to that price. Uh, there are also many uh, commodities uh, in the world supply chain, which uh, if we're sensible, we will, we will repatriate at least some uh, of the production capability for basic pharmaceuticals, chemical precursors, for, uh, again, the simple things like pr protective equipment and uh, medical supplies and so forth. Uh, and in that case, we will be paying more for them. Uh, and so you, you can, and you can see, I mean, if the meat supply uh, situation becomes untenable, we'll be paying more for meat. That's a big issue in the United States. People like cheap meat in the U.S. Uh, so uh, you can see an, a, a problem of inflation in certain kinds of basic commodities and declining living standards as a result of all of this going forward. Um, what the balance of it is, I'm not, you know, I'm not so sure because what we what we measure in living standards has been, you know, the increase of durables, many of which people don't really, you know, they discover they can get along without, uh, and many many people in the middle income third world have, have realized this for years that they can they can they can delay their purchases of the novelty of this or that, uh, and um, and it doesn't affect their well being so well. The United States has been on the front edge of a kind of consumer based. Uh, novelty-based society for a long time. Uh, well, we could we adjust to something else? I think we probably could. Uh, so I don't know how what the what the balance of this is is going forward. I, d I do know that personally, I've spent a lot more time walking around my neighborhood and just taking photographs of the flowers that my neighbors are growing, uh, and that's something I never did before. I, I can tell you that it's good for my health, mental, physical, uh, and maybe other people have something of the same experience. Uh, can I ask a question? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I was wondering, how do you feel about the uh, China and U.S. relationship afterwards? Do you think there will be some uh, irrevocable damage and also about the supply chain system in the U.S. production? Do you think there will be any... Yeah, this, this, this, this is a very important question. And uh, right now we are in um, a very serious moment in which uh, practic many political forces in the United States are lined up to try and uh, deeply damage and poison the relationship between the United States and China. Uh, and this is notwithstanding the fact that we are still uh, very much need uh, the practical uh, relationship with China because they're the major supplier of a lot of things that we, are, we will have difficulty doing without. Uh, they, uh, but uh, there are very strong political forces uh, and uh, what was a year ago uh, all about Russia is now all about China. Uh, and uh, and a lot of it's, uh, you, know, you, can, you can judge for yourself uh, the, the, the substantial basis of uh, when Secretary Pompeo says, I have evidence that there, as he did yesterday, that the virus originated in a laboratory in Wuhan, and then was asked you know, for his evidence, and he had no evidence. Um, and, um, and I think he was asked whether he agreed that this was a naturally uh, likely, uh, the scientific consensus likely natural. He said, yeah, well, he didn't disagree with that. I mean, it's a nonsense position, basically, uh, or at least one which is totally unsubstantial, uh, unsubstantiated. Uh, and even if it were true, it would not be the basis for a, uh, uh, a uh, for plunging the world into war. Uh, but it is clear that large parts of the American elites uh, would like to um, uh, cut off that relationship. Uh, and uh, I don't think we can rule out that they'll have substantial success. We'll see. Thank you. Uh, Professor Galbraith. Uh, we thank you very much uh, for this excellent uh, lecture and thank you for sparing your time to us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much. I always enjoy uh, having a chance to, sp to, to do this sort of thing. I've enjoyed this one very much and I appreciate very much your time and your attention. So I hope to be, uh, be, in, be in continued communication going forward. Much appreciated. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Refik Hocam size de çok teşekkürler. Zuri'den <gülüyor> bütün teşekkürler. Çok iyi oldu bana. <gülüyor> İki tane Thank bilgisayarla you. bağlanabildim ama Yo, gayet güzel. Ne şey yapmak lazım? Bunların evet. Meet'in bir Google'cıların bir numarası var. O olsa <gülüyor>